And today we have uh, Maxfield Stewart, who's uh, from Riot Games. Uh, they have literally hundreds of apps and hundreds of jobs per hour. Uh, and he's going to explain how they're using Docker, how they dockerize their CI CD pipeline. Maxfield, awesome. it's yours. Uh, thank you. Mic check. Sounds like it's working. Everybody hear me all right? I can hear myself, so I'm hoping, hoping that works. Uh, yeah, thank you for the excellent introduction. Uh, I feel like I can skip the first two slides. Uh, just for the record, this is Thinking Inside the Container, a continuous delivery story. If you're in the wrong presentation, I won't be offended. If you get up and walk out now, it's OK. Uh, for everybody else, uh, let's get started, if it will actually advance my slides for me. There we go. All right. <clears throat> So who am I? Obviously, my name is Max. I'm an engineering manager at Riot Games. I started at Riot about four years ago, and I came on board there when continuous delivery was the hottest trend. They brought me on board to help think about how do we ship League of Legends, which I'll talk about in a second, continuously. One of the challenges we face is that League is huge, and this talk is going to be about shipping League in all of its associated platform microservices. I've been doing this at a lot of companies for about two decades. Uh, I've walked all walks of the software development life cycle. I'm not just about building software. I've developed my own applications. I've been an operations manager. Brief moonlighting event as an IT director. Uh, lots of stuff. And most recently, I've been blogging about this on the Riot Games engineering blog, which led me to here to talk about this today. And one of the things I want to mention before I get going is one of the most interesting engineering challenges we have at Riot is our goal, to be the most player-focused company in the world. It's an aspiration. But this drives everything we do engineering-wise. It's why you're not going to hear me say one technology is better than another. The solutions are what matter to our players. At the end of the day, if we're shipping value quickly, continuously to our players, that's all that matters. Our players will probably never hear of Docker unless you happen to be in this room right now. Speaking of that, if I could get the slide advance going, how many of you have heard of League of Legends? Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, sweet. Well, I don't need to explain it at all. You all know what it is. Um, for those of you who haven't, like the, the small few who haven't, League of Legends is kind of huge. Uh, over 70 million players monthly is how we're measuring that around the world. Uh, our peak concurrent players playing League of Legends at any one time is like, Seven and a half million, it's kind of ridiculous. These numbers matter not because it's a wildly successful video game. These numbers matter because to back this, you end up having a giant platform, one that we also, like everybody else here, are thinking about how do we turn this into a bunch of microservices. We've been on that journey for almost three years now. The other thing that happens when you start to achieve continuous delivery at this kind of scale is you build a lot of software. In our case, we're cranking out 1.25 million builds a year. And if you follow continuous delivery, we don't ship 1.25 million builds a year. We just produce that much stuff to test and see if we should ship it. Another thing that comes with 20 years of experience is I get told I like to tell a lot of stories, uh, war stories as they were. And this one's no different. I often call this one thinking inside the container. It's about what happens after you achieve continuous delivery and realize everything else you do has to scale. And one of the solutions we created to this problem that I'm going to talk about today is a build farm that thinks of build environments as Docker containers. The farm we're running right now that does this spits out about 10,000 to 14,000 containers a week. Now, those are not containers being shipped to live. That's a different problem. These are build environments. We spin them up every time we need to build code, and then we throw them away. It ends up being a fairly unique problem, one that had its own challenges within the Docker ecosphere. The system itself currently is holding somewhere around 50 to 120 build jobs an hour. And it looks a little like this diagram right here. I'm going to get back into the weeds of this. This is up here just to explain this isn't actually that complicated. It's fronted by a Jenkins server, backed by a Docker Swarm, not the fancy one we all saw this morning. Like I think we're running Docker Swarm uh, 0.3. Bunch of Docker hosts for horizontal scaling and some details I'll get into later. But it's easy, and it's built on open source technology. You could walk out of this room right now and go deploy it without paying anybody a license fee. And it's pretty important to us to be part of the open source community. This story, though, 
shouldn't start at the end. It should start about two years ago, as I mentioned, after we started to achieve continuous delivery and see the results. Let me talk to you about those results in terms of some statistics. Two years ago, so this is 2014, uh, the build engineering team that I was on had started to build a build farm to handle all the software we're shipping. There were over 3,500 unique build jobs within the single Jenkins server we run. 3,500 jobs on one Jenkins server. Woo, going too fast. That translates to almost 650 builds an hour. So six times the size of this Docker build farm I'm talking about today. This thing hums. And it's built out of this ever-growing list, at least two years ago, of build servers. Some of these are giant physical machines, but a lot of them were virtual machines. And we had a problem with this kind of architecture and this kind of thinking. We realized that we were getting requests to spin up new build environments to build new microservices and new software for engineering teams one or two build servers a week. And we ran the numbers and said, wow, this is going to go for like a year. We're screwed. We're really screwed because we're an engineering team of four people. Now, I have one option. I can hire more build engineers. Why would I need to? Well, the way this worked is engineering teams would come to us and they'd file a ticket. Hey, build team, I need a new build environment. It's Java 1.8 some special flavor of this, I don't like my SQL, I want Percona, or I want Redis. They'd give us the specs and we'd build it. And we'd make it. And this looks simple, but in reality, this is kind of how we were operating. We were just buried, <laughs> right? If, you, if you've been on a build engineering team, this is probably your life. And we hated it. We didn't want to work this way. We also didn't want to end up having like a 40-person build team. We knew the math didn't work. Adding servers, some number of servers meant some number of build engineers. It's not really how a team should think. So we, we kind of took a pause and said, what do we want? What do we really want? Why is this frustrating us? Well, the single biggest frustration goes back to the fact that we're player focused. The end goal here is that our teams need to be able to ship software, add value to our players as fast as they can. And even though we'd achieved continuous delivery, we weren't able to move as fast as the system could. Because we, the build engineering team, we were the hurdle. We were the block. Suddenly, tickets, like people couldn't ship. They were waiting weeks for build environments just to experiment with a new piece of technology. So we needed product teams to own their entire stack. Now, our engineers were fantastic at owning their code bases. And like all of you, many of them were on the journey of learning how to do DevOps, how to integrate folks into their teams so that they could also operate their applications in live. But they didn't own their build environments. And that was the key. We needed them to own the whole stack. That meant we wanted them to be able to define their build environment as code. And we need a solution for that problem. And at the time, we were looking at all the usual suspects. Maybe we'd build Amazon AMIs from some depth. Maybe we'd use Packer to help define these environments. Maybe we could do something in Azure. Maybe VMware has a templating solution for us, OpenStack. We literally had deployments of all of these things in prototypes of our own APIs, experiments in AWS. Uh, we knew we weren't particularly happy with the speed at producing images, but it could work. And right in 2014, something smacked us upside the head. It looked kind of blue and huge and kind of like a whale. Uh, it was Docker. Like, first it came as a whisper. Have you heard of this Docker thing? And we were too busy. We had too many tickets. But it really didn't take long uh, until inevitably one of the ticket requests came in that said, hey, could you, uh, could you put Docker in the farm? We we might want to ship containers, and we need a way to Docker build. In fact, uh, the guy who did that to me, his name is Carl Quinn. He's right here in the front smiling at me. Uh, <laughs> and we needed to figure this out. Now, of course, we're a build engineering team being buried by tickets. So our first reaction is, oh, gee, look. The engineers have come up with yet another way to put something in production. One thing we believed very devoutly in build engineering land at Riot is that how you ship, how you deploy in production is the re core requirement for how you have to build your software. So of course, that meant the entire four of us on the build engineering team had to go learn some Docker. Uh, and initially, you know, spare time here and there, but it started to become fun for us. Like most people here have ever made their first Docker file and realized, wait, I can throw that away and make another one? And it doesn't, I don't have to install all this crap on my machine? Uh, we really started to get excited, and that led to an idea. One day, while we were blood, sweat, and tears figuring out how to clean up yet more disk space and store Docker images somewhere so that we could ship containers live, we asked ourselves the question, well, wouldn't it be awesome if 
Engineers could just give us a Docker file that defined their build environment. That might solve all our problems. These things are so much lighter weight than anything else we're dealing with. We said, yeah, but how could, how could we make that work with Jenkins? How many folks in here use Jenkins? I think there are more Jenkins users than League of Legends players. So uh, after the talk, if you guys could get on that, uh, that'd be great. No, that's awesome. Sweet. Uh, I was hoping for that. Uh, Riot uses Jenkins probably for the same reason you use Jenkins. It's huge. It's like 140,000, 150,000 deployments in the wild. It's open source. That means if we're having a problem, odds are somebody's already solved it. And we don't have to go build our own system. Now, Riot uses a lot of other CI tools, but this story is talking about how we use Jenkins. I'm going to blow through the Jenkins primer, because just about everybody in here raised their hand. The thing that matters the most to this story is about how Jenkins thinks of build slaves. Now, it's a very classic architecture with a master server and a bunch of machines connected to it. Master server is the controller that assigns works. But the thing we're after here when we're asking ourselves about containers is Jenkins looks at build slaves with labels. At Riot, we use really boring labels like Java 1.8, Windows, Team A, Golang 1.4, Team B, that kind of stuff. But it's relevant because our engineers use Jenkins to programmatically define their build jobs. And they create a job, and they assign a label that should match up with one of these build slaves. And then Jenkins itself just figures out, with a simple build message queue, how to allocate that job to some spare resource capacity. So all we had to do was figure out how to trick Jenkins into thinking that a build slave was a Docker container. Now, when you're, these days, you're like, well, yeah, there's probably like 5,000 plugins. But two years ago, this was pretty foreign concept. We were struggling to find answers. And assuming we could get Jenkins to use a container as a build slave, we still had to figure out how the engineers were going to give us the Docker files and how we're going to hook those up to Jenkins. And then, you know, the 800-pound gorilla. It had to scale because we were building a lot of software. Well, when it comes to the question of whether or not Jenkins can talk to a Docker container as a build slave, this was a solved problem. Even two years ago, Google gave us the answer. This is essentially the same Docker file I found online on Docker Hub for a Jenkins build slave. This is the one we're using. There are a couple very minor tweaks. We install Git in here and a couple of other stuff that we care about. But it's really all you need in our use case is one of the greatest Docker faux pas ever. The container has to run SSH as its primary process. I apologize to those who are groaning. But that's how we like Jenkins to talk to our build slaves. And we didn't want to change that. It's got to have a compatible version of Java, so it's Java 1.7 or better. It needs to connect as something like a Jenkins user. And that user has to have write permissions within the workspace so that when a build is running, it can do what it wants. This doesn't build any software, though. This just allows Jenkins to treat a container as a build slave. As long as we're using Docker files, we immediately started to get a little creative. Like, well, we can like bake a couple things on top of this and make it globally available to all the engineers. At Riot, that translates to we just have a thin layer of what we call universal tools. If you've ever been a build engineer, these are things like simple scripts to help interact with your artifact stores, things that are standard and probably custom to your environment. So I'm not showing you a, a Docker file up here. It probably wouldn't be relevant. You couldn't reuse my scripts. Uh, but at the end of the day, the one that matters is the engineering layer. So the engineering teams produce Docker files like this. And it, sorry for the folks in the back. You probably can't read that. But the point was the actual container is huge. And this is one of the first challenges of this system. A Docker container in a build farm looks nothing like a Docker container in production. It's fat. It's heavy. It's got a Java development kit in there. It runs a JVM. This one's got like two versions of Percona in it, because you're probably running unit tests inside this thing. So you're doing all kinds of Docker no-nos, like spinning up dozens of other processes and tools inside what's supposed to be a single process. We knew this going in, but man, the temptation of that Docker file as an expression of the build environment was just too hard to ignore. And all of this worked. I could spin up a container, connect Jenkins to it, and Jenkins would treat it like a build slave. But it presented a new problem. I was still taking tickets to go spin one up for an engineering team. I actually hadn't solved the problem. I created some cool tech, but I hadn't solved anything yet. So we wanted a way to get Jenkins to automatically configure one of these if given a Docker file. Could it just go create the build slave? Uh, so as any good engineer does when they don't know what to do and have never done it before, you try to Google your answer. Uh, and we came up with a couple of hits, thankfully, even two years ago. 
there was this thing called the Docker plugin, a thing called the Mesos plugin, and a thing called the Kubernetes plugin that all came back when you searched for Docker and Jenkins on Google. Uh, what was cool about all of these plugins is they all offered the same dream. If given a Docker image and a label that you give it, it could go into Jenkins configuration, and then whenever a build job appeared in the Jenkins build queue, it would automatically execute a Docker run or whatever the particular interface wanted to spin up a container. It would automatically create a build slave dynamically in Jenkins and connect to it, run whatever was expected to run, and then it would throw the container away. The beauty of open source is we didn't have to write any of that. We just had to choose one of these three items. So which one did we pick? Well, we were new to Docker, and we'd heard of Mesos and Kubernetes, but we weren't about to go run out and go deploy Mesos or go deploy Kubernetes just to solve this particular problem. So we decided to start with the Docker plugin, because getting the Docker daemon up and running, well, it wasn't that hard two years ago, even though it's significantly easier today. So this is the way we went. And we were thinking, well, for now, we'll keep it simple. We can always scale into one of these solutions. If you've never played with a Docker plugin, in fact, either of those plugins, their configuration in Jenkins looks a little like this. And this is one of Jenkins' fault. UI is not, no, they don't win any awards. It's this beast of a form, but there's only three fields on here that matter. Where's the Docker daemon? Where's the Docker host? What is the name of the image that you want to be a build environment? And what label do you want to give it? And then there's a whole bunch of settings here that, trust me, if you play with, you run into all kinds of trouble. Because we just like, oh, look, a number. We can grow that. That won't hurt. Uh, yes, it does hurt. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But we still had a problem. Sweet, now I can go create build slaves dynamically. Whenever there's work in the queue, I still have to go into the Jenkins admin page and fill a bunch of stuff out, which means I'm still taking a ticket from an engineering team that wants a new build environment. Even though they've gone and made it, they need to wait for me to just go into Jenkins admin and hook some stuff up. So wouldn't it be cool if we had an API that just took the two things we need to know from the engineers? What's your image name? And what's your label? Preferably something self-descriptive that explains your project. And this is where the Jenkins ecosystem really saved our butts. We'd been operating Jenkins at scale for a long time. And one of the ways we favor automating Jenkins is using Groovy. In particular, there's a really handy plugin called the Scripler plugin that lets you store Groovy scripts you might use to do all kinds of Jenkins administration. So we had this crazy idea. Well, this plugin lets you expose REST endpoints. If we can just figure out how to get this plugin to modify the Jenkins runtime environment with the new configuration objects that come in, so we just need to go learn the Docker plugin object model, we can probably achieve this goal. And this is where open source becomes a big winner. We just went over to the Docker plugin source code page, crawled everything, figured out every object, how their config pages translated, and wrote, it trails off a little bit, but I swear it's not much more than 100 lines of Groovy code to achieve our API goals. If you're looking for this, I will give you the link to my GitHub. It's up there. It's all free and available, uh, no strings attached. Of course, it presents a new problem. Now I had this interface that any engineering team could just give me a Docker image and a label, and Jenkins would happily configure it as a build slave. And we ran into the classic garbage in, garbage out. One of the really gnarly things that can happen is an engineering team who might not understand all of the working bits gives you a Docker image that doesn't work with Jenkins. It probably worked locally. They probably tested it. But they're not running Jenkins locally in their test environments. They plug this thing in. And then what happens is Jenkins literally goes into a death spiral, trying to spin up your container. You'd be surprised how many containers Jenkins can create desperately trying to meet your request. We're talking thousands, hundreds of thousands. The type that you just format the Docker host and start over, because running Docker RMI to clean that up uh, just takes too long. Uh, so we needed another solution to a problem that we had just created. We needed a way to inspect these images as they were being given to us, some way to determine if it was good or bad. Initially, when we figured this out, we started just doing it manually. And that's always a bad sign. So we quickly tried to automate ourselves out of that particular job. And we created a tool we call Harbor Master. Just because Docker, Naval Theme, Harbor Master, fleets, containers, we thought it was funny. Uh, but it does just a couple of things. All of those conditions for a Docker container that I talked about up front, the four checks, it checks for those. It grabs the image, pulls it to a, its own Docker host, runs it, says, hey, 
Is SSH running? Sweet. Can I SSH in? Yes. Am I the Jenkins user? Yes. Can I write to the disk drive? Yes, I can. Is the right version of Java installed? Yes, it is. And once we made this, we tacked on a few other things that are Riot specific, but no big deal. This thing turned out to be really easy to write. We wrote it in Golang because we also wanted to learn some Go, but you could write this in Python, Ruby. You could probably do it in Bash. And if you do, I want to see it and give you an award. It's, it's not that hard. Uh, but it turned out to be the missing piece of glue we needed to create the workflow we wanted. But there was one more thing we hadn't solved. I have this loop now where an engineer can give me an image, go to the Harbor Master, run it. Harbor Master will auto-configure Jenkins. Everything looks good. But I forgot about, I have to scale this. And if we rewind a bit, the Docker plugin expects a Docker daemon, a single Docker daemon to talk to. Now, you can configure it with multiple Docker daemons, but it doesn't do anything fancy. If you put the same image on both, it just allocates all of them to the first one. And we realized we need a load balancer, some way to distribute load across multiple Docker hosts. So we were thinking, man, if only there was a thing out there that understood the Docker API, but horizontally distributed the container runs across any number of Docker hosts. And right as we were thinking we were going to have to write one, all of this wonderful information came from the Docker folks about Docker Swarm. Like 0.1 Docker Swarm became publicly available. And we said, oh, yeah, we got to get some of that. I think by the time we actually started testing, it was like Docker Swarm 0.2 or 0.2. And we had it. We had a Jenkins server connected to a Docker Swarm. When we fooled the Docker plugin into just talking to the Swarm endpoint, it just worked. It didn't care because the API was consistent. We literally threw a party because this saved us a tremendous amount of engineering time. And it just started to beautifully scale. We'd throw more Docker hosts at it, and it would just poop out the build containers wherever on that back end. It was great. And then we ran to all of our engineers, and we said, you got to try this, right? Because we've had our miracle workflow. We've got engineers who can create Docker files and turn them into Docker images and just upload them to a registry. The engineer just goes to Harbor Master, says, here's my image name, and this is the label I'd like to give it. Harbor Master pulls the image down, runs tests to confirm this will pass as a build slave, goes ahead and pulls that image to the entire Docker swarm. Initially, we didn't do this, but we discovered what would happen is if we didn't do this, when Jenkins went to run their build, if it happened to get assigned to a Docker host that hadn't pulled the image before, well, this giant Docker pull would happen. And I know Docker pulls are supposed to be fast and sleek and sexy, but when you've got three gigs of a Java development environment to pull down, it's not pretty. And that job would sit in the build queue, and it would just wait. And an engineer waiting for water to boil would run over and go, your whole system doesn't work. My build hasn't started yet. And there was no explanation given to like, well, it's just pulling. It'll, be, it'll take a little while. So we pre-optimized, and we just pulled it to the entire cluster. And then the last little piece of magic was Harbor Master, after had done all this and confirmed that the swarm had pulled the image, would just go ahead and hit the API we created and configure Jenkins. And from that moment on, the engineer could start creating build jobs. And real quick, I know this isn't a Jenkins conference. This is a Docker conference. This is the way we're starting to define build jobs at Riot with Jenkins. This is the pipeline DSL plugin. We favor this because of how simple it is, especially with this whole setup. So I really wanted to post it here. Literally, all this code does, it's another flavor of Groovy, is say, spin up a build node with this label. That label matches the Docker image, thanks to the Docker plugin. Then it does a git sync. There's a simple command there to any repo. And then whatever the engineer wants to run against that. I've just got buildme.sh up here because we all wish everybody's build job was one single glorious shell script. I know it doesn't work out that way. It's a presentation. I'm sorry. Um, and then we realized we came full circle. I've solved my problem. Nobody needs to make a ticket to create a build environment anymore. But this mess started because Carl Quinn wanted to build Docker containers to make them go live. So immediately this became available, the engineering team started putting Docker clients inside these Docker containers. Uh, cue wonderful memes that I love, right? Gotta, we're doing Docker and Docker all of a sudden, and that has all kinds of challenges. For us, the challenge was, well, the default Docker endpoint when you called Docker inside one of these hosts connected to the Swarm was the Swarm itself. Every time somebody did a Docker build or spun up test cases with Docker run, it was provisioning containers against our Swarm that was only supposed to exist for build environments, not entire application test environments. Or worse, when your test cases crashed and left all this cruft behind on a Docker image, like broken containers and dead states, 
Suddenly the build farm started crashing because people's Docker build jobs were crashing because their build jobs don't always work. And we needed an answer to that problem. And it didn't take us a whole lot of creative thinking to go, all we got to do is get all the Docker commands inside the swarm to run against something else. So we overloaded the Docker host environment variable across the entire swarm and pointed it at something we called dry dock because we like naval themes. Uh, and it, that's just a single Docker daemon right now. But it could easily be a swarm if we needed it. But right now, one Docker daemon on a fairly large VM handles all of this traffic across the build farm. Everybody's Docker builds go there. Inevitably, when somebody does something horrible, like a fork bomb inside a Docker container that they're running, uh, we can literally just wipe this thing and restart it or image a new one, hit a button and get one. It's pretty slick. And that meant build engineers could revert to their natural state, which is sipping Mai Tais on a beach in Santa Monica. Uh, it's not really that simple. I wish it was. Uh, so the question would be, how do, you, how do you build one? I don't have enough time in this conversation to go into the weeds of every step. But the good news is every step is already written on the Riot Games Engineering tech blog. There are six or seven blog series there that walk you through everything, full tutorial, soup to nuts, everything you ever wanted to know about Docker and more. For an audience like this, it's probably a little bit more Docker than you need to know, but it assumes you're starting from scratch. And if that's not, you're like, well, I've read those blogs, or I don't want to read six blogs, that's fine. Up on my personal GitHub, uh, it's there for everybody. You can literally just pull a GitHub file down, assuming you have Docker Toolbox installed, run a couple scripts, add a couple of pieces of configuration, and the whole thing will start right up on your desktop. Just figure out how to scale it and get your own Docker hosts, and you're good to go. So I'm making it sound really easy. <laughs> Look, just install Jenkins, right? Well, it's probably Docker Run, right? Uh, start a swarm, and I'm good to go, and everything's magic. No, it's... We started this journey two years ago. I'm talking to you now two years later. Obviously, some stuff happened in between that didn't make this happen, or I would have talked last year at DockerCon. So there's some lessons we learned. And this is really, really hard to say at DockerCon, where I'm surrounded by you folks, and everybody loves Docker, and it's a huge Docker community. Docker's not simple. It's a whole lot simpler than what we were doing in the DevOps world. But my customers, my users, my players, are engineering teams that have never really had to worry about configuring an environment in the first place. And here I'm saying, just write this Docker file, and everything will be OK. It's not true for them, especially because they're writing one Docker file for their build environment, another Docker file for their production environment. The questions were fast and furious. More importantly, whenever their builds broke on this farm, they're like, well, it's probably because you're doing something funny with Docker. Right? That was the unilateral way the ticket would come in. I think this Docker thing won't work for my Maven and compile, which was like, we as Docker users know that's not true, but I can't force them to come to the water trough. I have to teach them. And the solution for this problem for us was that, was teaching. Anytime somebody showed up and looked even the, a little bit confused, we're like, give us an hour. We're going to sit down with you. We're going to help you make your first build environment. Yes, I've got documents, but let me just help you. I promise within two hours, you'll have a first build environment and you can get going. And that leads to the second problem along the simple front. We learned this while we were playing with it. But again, when you're introducing Docker to people who don't understand it, Docker containers are not virtual machines. They can feel like it. In a lot of ways, you do things like yum update inside a Docker file. You do that in a VM, right? But there are a lot of things you can't do in a Docker container that you might want from a virtual machine. For us at Riot, we'd gotten so used to having like 100 virtual machines, we had all kinds of pre-configuration on there, like mounting network drives to various artifact stores or other resources, uh, pre-installed credentials files that were configured when somebody, like, oh, I got my VM, I root in, I set up a one-time creds file buried somewhere in the system. Well, none of that's available in your container unless you put it there. And you don't really want to be putting that, some of that stuff in a Docker image. I'll get to that in a second. So you have to have rules around what's in the Docker file, what's at runtime. We did not want to mount anything from our Docker host. We, we were hoping for this magical, mystical world where we had no configuration management other than install Docker on CentOS 7 and connect it to the swarm. We didn't want anything special. So we kind of stuck to that. Then the other one. If you run a lot of Docker hosts, you may or may not have this problem. This hit us in the build farm long before it ever hit Riot in production. 
When you're building a lot of images, when you're doing a lot of Docker pulls, you're executing a lot of Docker runs at insane volumes, you suddenly get surprised when your host runs out of disk space. Like, I thought this Docker thing was supposed to be efficient. And you remote into that box. Why is varlib docker eating all the space? There's no containers running. Well, wait, docker ps minus a. Oh my god, there's like 5,000 dead containers on here. Clean them up. Oh, all my disk space came back. These things floored us. And keeping up with it was kind of crazy in the build farm. So we went back to Google. Has anybody found this problem? And right before we were going to write our own script, we literally charted one out. It just has to do these things. Spotify. If you're in the room, Spotify, thank you. You saved my ass. All right? Announced this blog post about Docker garbage collection. It's just a really simple Python script that knows where all the bodies are buried on a Docker host. We threw it into a Docker container and just run it on every one of those Docker hosts. So not quite configuration management, but so long as I keep this thing running, it keeps my disks clean. We tweaked it just a tiny bit for things we care about, but they're really kind of specific to us. I highly recommend anybody running a large number of Docker hosts, if you're not doing it yet, have a solution for the cruft problem. As long as we're talking about what happens when you lose a Docker host because you run out of disk space, we should talk about maintenance. We're running around 10 Docker hosts, plus a Swarm, plus a Jenkins farm. And the first time we ran into a situation, go, well, Docker sure does change versions a lot. And we'd like to use the new version. Like the first build of this was Docker 0.8. Uh, and we wanted 0.9 and 1 and 1.1. There were all these new features kept coming out. You need to have a plan. Uh, more importantly, your hosts will fail. Docker daemon is just another process, like any other application. It can crash. These things can become disconnected. Uh, my favorite war story is we were running Docker 1.8 for a very long time in this farm. Docker 1.8 had a particularly gnarly bug. Uh, doing a Docker pull against a registry could sometimes hang. You only notice this if you ran a lot of Docker pulls like we were. And it would kill the ability to pull that image to that host until you restarted the Docker daemon. So thank you, Docker, for separating the daemon from the container engine. We appreciate that. But when we were running Docker 1.8, we had to restart these hosts. So we built a script that just rolling restarts them. This is how we fixed the problem. We called that script the Kraken, mainly because it was really, really fun to say, release the Kraken. Right? <laughs> Uh, but as long as we had this script that could pull hosts off our swarm and put them back on, we might as well enhance it to do some things like, well, go ahead and update the Docker version, and then put it back on, or pull half of them offline. So have a plan for, for maintaining your Docker hosts in a swarm so that when you start to horizontally scale, you can literally plug and play with your hosts. And I talked about this problem. How are you going to upgrade? Right? There's always a new version of Docker. I just came to DockerCon and learned about Docker 112. What's the first thing I want to do when I get home? Convince my product owner I need to upgrade. Right? We know we got to do it. You just run a swarm. No, you don't understand. If you just do it willy-nilly, you're going to run over yourself. In this ecosystem, I'll just tell you right now, if you're thinking about upgrading Docker, you need to make sure it works with whatever version of swarm you're using. Now, with Docker 112, surprise me this morning, you probably don't have to worry about that anymore. But if you're running this before Docker 112, Keep it in mind. If you change the version of Swarm, like I'm going to do, I hope, when I get home, uh, you need to see if the Docker plugin can still talk to it. Because the reality is the Docker API sometimes changes, and sometimes things need to be updated. The good news is it's all open source. If you find the thing it needs, you just commit the, the fix. Or the developer probably was already aware and has something ready to go. Uh, and if you upgrade Jenkins, you probably need to test the entire ecosystem. So if you're a heavy Jenkins user, Add that to however your rules are for updating Jenkins. For the record, no, we're not yet running Jenkins 2, but we really want to. And this is one of the things we have to consider when we're making that shift. Does it all work? And I hinted at this one already, and there's been a lot of good talks here today. When it comes to a build farm, you really need to think about how you want to put your credentials into your build environments. Remember, your build environments are now portable. They can go anywhere. They're expressed as a Docker image in a registry. If you've decided it's OK to put your SSH private keys in those images, and somebody pulls down those images, well, they've got keys to the kingdom. If you put your AWS keys inside those containers, same problem. Whoever has that image can now control your production environment. So at Riot, that's a big no-no. We don't do that. But you need an alternative solution to inject those keys. There are a lot of cool options. For now, we're locking down our Jenkins master server and putting it all on the master server so the master server can inject them as environment variables when the containers start up. 
There's a lot of nitty gritty details. If you're really curious about this problem, come see me after the talk. Be happy to talk to you about it in more detail. But have a plan for this, or you'll suddenly find your entire environment is not secure. So did we succeed? Remember, we started this with a problem. The problem was, could engineers express their build environments as source code and get the build engineering team out of the business of fixing broken builds, upgrading software, and installing new build slaves? Could we come up with a new scaling model? I would say we came out of beta for this and made it widely available to every Riot engineering team about a year ago. Since we did that, over 1,200 new build jobs have been created. So I gave you that 3,500 number in our Jenkins farm. We're now running something close to 5,000 build jobs at Riot. All 1,200 of those jobs were created on this platform. In fact, there's been a 100 or 200 job reduction in the original Jenkins farm as teams just forklift some of their stuff out and convert it, because this is just easier to use. That means over 30% of all build environments at Riot are actually expressed as Docker files. And that's pretty cool. We're currently clocking in something like 130 Docker images to represent build environments. Now, not all of those are build jobs. They also found this is a really elegant way to automate all kinds of stuff. So not every one of those things is a build environment. Um, and those tickets of us getting inundated with build environments, they literally disappeared. A few of them came in as helped me learn Docker. But we were no longer getting asked every day to go fix some broken build environment somewhere. And here's the shocker. I was the engineering manager for a team that exists in every place I've ever worked, a build engineering team. Riot no longer has a build engineering team. There's that old catchphrase, we automated ourselves out of a job. And it's fairly true in this case. The role we were playing was no longer needed because we built tools that took care of it. That actually freed us up. We didn't go fire all the build engineers. A funny thing happened along the way. They all became Docker experts. It just so happens, Riot is trying to run its entire microservice platform and containers in production, and we happen to need Docker experts. So the entire build engineering team joined our cluster engineering team. And that's what they're focused on today, using this technology amongst a bunch of other stuff, figuring out how we're going to run huge amounts of containers at scale. The build pipeline is just one small piece of that puzzle. But the good news is, nobody sits there and takes a ticket anymore and says, my build broke. Go install a new version of Java, please. So that's it. That's my talk. Thank you. So a couple of notes. There's a bunch of rioters in the room. I am happy to take any questions you have on this. Please raise your hands. I think there's mics over here. Likewise, if you don't have time to ask questions today, almost all of those rioters are going to be at the Tap House tonight around 6 o'clock. We'd love it if you came by and talked shop. We have all kinds of questions for you guys about how you're doing things, and we'd like to learn more. So if you have questions, I guess, uh, raise hands or step up to the microphone or come see me after. There's a hand. Why don't we start uh, with the man in the orange shirt and the red hat. We'll start a line over here in this mic, and I'll do my best. Go nuts. OK. Um, you uh, briefly mentioned about dealing with security or credentials. Currently, yep. we're passing in uh, for a particular customer, we're passing in a payload in JSON to the operation that's running in a container. Is that bad? Uh, so the question is, uh, if you're passing in a JSON payload in a container, is that bad for security reasons? The, I can only answer that with a question. Well, what's, what's in that JSON payload? Credentials, encryption keys? There are, there, there are credentials, an API key. It could, be an ax, it could be a refresh token. It could be also, or, so basically, it's how to start the operation. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't say we have the best answer in the world. So the answer to my question was, yes, there's some credentials and encryption keys in there that are needed. I highly recommend whatever solution you implement finds a way to mount those in when you do the Docker run, when you spin the container up. Maybe you can inject them as an environment variable. JSON does work that way. Or you can write a little script that will write, write it out as a config file when the container comes up. We're thinking about this problem actively. The other one you can do, if you have the engineering manpower, is use something like Vault or Secrets as a Service. Actually store the credentials in a secondary service like via an API. Put the key to that credential as an environment variable into the container, and then query the, the secondary service and pull the credentials into the container Okay. Uh, as a way around that, that sort of first password problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll switch to this side. Question over here. 
Uh, just a quick question. You were mentioning um, you've kind of made it uh, where engineers are self-serviceable. They can do their own build environment. Yep. How does that work with like repositories? Are you letting Jenkins automatically like find them? And what's the best approach for that? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, so you made this glorious self-service environment for engineers for build environments, but what about their code repositories, right? How do they get their code in? Uh, Riot engineers love themselves some disparate source control. We've got Perforce fans and GitHub fans. Uh, one of the reasons we've become a fan of the Jenkins pipeline plugin is you can literally define a build job as go, go get the build job from this source repo over here. For now, we're having the engineers define those jobs themselves, but we are looking at options to just, we know our GitHub organization, for example, so we can just crawl it looking for these marker files. If you've ever used something like Travis CI, it's the same sort of implementation, and just auto-create Jenkins jobs. You're ahead of me by like six months. That's where we're headed. Okay. Uh, but that's, that's what we want to do. Okay. So it's a really good question, because you're thinking the right way. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Uh, over here. Hey, um, I work at Workers, so uh, like build farms is kind of what I do. I awesome. actually have a question regarding um, kind of like your operations around Docker. Sure. So we run Docker GC, and um, we still come up with a problem where Docker PS will just hang infinitely, <laughs> and nothing will run, and like our customers' jobs will be queued forever. So I was kind of wondering, how do you like manage Docker when it gets in a bad state? So it sounds like you just kill it and start a new one? Uh, we have two options. So the question there is, look, you mentioned Docker GC, and you said you were in this magical, mystical land of everything just works. This is a presentation. Not everything just works. You're right. Even we still see some things get left behind. Uh, uh, the individual here works for Worker, which is probably running build environments at scale even larger than I am. Uh, for us, there's two options. The perfect world is I just throw away the Docker host. Remember, I've got no configuration management on that Docker host. Right. This is one of the reasons. I can throw it away, hit a button, and get a new one, and just hook it back up to the swarm and not worry about it. In certain cases where I'm trying to understand what's going wrong, mm -hmm. I might just restart the Docker daemon or take a closer look and poke around in varlib docker, try to figure out why. This failed, right? And if you go on there and Docker PS is empty, you're in the clear. But if Docker PS minus A is showing still hundreds of containers or like your image counts or your disk space, we still see weird corruption issues. The other thing we do is we just RMI, Docker RMI everything and Docker RM minus F minus V, kill all volumes, everything. Yeah. If, Docker, if varlib Docker is still eating space, we consider the box a loss. OK, so you just say, <laughs> turn it off and turn it back on again. Uh, again, we just like we, we want to be able to rule the Docker hosts as dead weight and just get rid of them and spin another one up. Uh, right. We would like to dig in more to what the exact problem is. Uh, but in all fairness, Docker keeps getting better. Yeah. So we're literally like, these guys, the folks in this room, make Docker better. We have a solution that works around the problem. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yep. Uh, on the left side. Thanks. So uh, <clears throat> as I understand, all the developers are throwing their builds into your swarm for their Docker building. And uh, most of the time, if something's wrong within their building process, within the container, how can they ac access the container for them to debug or take a look at what's wrong? And for the building process especially, a lot of builds happening overnight. And when, when somebody realizes this build is failing, it's hours after the build has been finished. So. How do you handle this? Oh, man, you asked two really good questions. Let me see if I can capture them. One is, look, you've built this self-expression of a build environment, but the reality is builds can still fail. And engineers are still going to want to go in there and find out what happened. That's question one. Exactly. Uh, and question two is, really long-running build jobs will be especially susceptible to this problem. So do you anything special for things that like run overnight uh, in this case? Uh, let's start with the first one. So one of the glorious things that I, I actually scrubbed out of this prez for time is that because the build environment is a portable Docker image, an engineer can, can pull that image to their desktop. In fact, they probably created it on their desktop. We're currently going through a campaign to encourage every engineer to compile their code inside the containers from their desktop. Like, just change your build scripts to start your build environment and run your compile commands in there. Mount your source code into the container and compile. That way, if there actually is anything wrong with the container, you can find it. Now, there are still edge cases where your build could fail only in the Docker swarm. Uh, we had one the other day that had to do with network drivers on the, doc on the machines themselves. It was infuriating. 
Uh, if necessary, we can give engineers access to the swarm. Like, they can just hit the swarm endpoint. All I got to do is tell them where it is and how to, how to access it. They can do Docker run by hand. It'll spin up on the swarm in a container. Then they can SSH in as the Jenkins user and execute their build command by hand. And we have had to debug that way a few times. Okay. Uh, but because the container is portable, I don't need to go through the Jenkins ecosystem. I just tell the swarm to run it and figure out where it is and connect to it myself. Uh, for long running jobs, uh, we try to kill those whenever we find. If somebody's running like a 20 hour build process, the first thing we want to do is sit down with them and ask them why. Uh, in, in a world of continuous delivery, that gets really ugly. If you can only build once a day. Uh, for example, like League of Legends was a three or four day build process four years ago. It's now a one hour build process and we wish it was a 10 minute build process. Right? The goal should be break that puppy down. Can we parallelize that for you? Are you doing a bunch of things in sequence? I can spin up 100 Docker containers and run 100 commands to help you parallelize your job. Uh, if you need more compute power, we'll deal with that problem too. The, the ideal world is we're building microservices here. It should only take a few minutes to compile. Uh, that said, the same thing works, right? We can always spin their build up job up by hand, and they can run it and watch it if they have 20 hours to wait to see what happens. Uh, so basically, this is a retrying if it fails. And then yeah, I mean, for the long running build job, I'd rather tackle that. Like, it has nothing to do with Docker. Let's go figure out why your build job takes 20 hours and see what we can do about that. That's a much meatier continuous delivery problem than just some tech to run it on. Does that, that help? Yep, yep. Awesome. Great, thanks. Uh, over here on the right. Uh, I actually have two questions as well. So the first one is, are you using anything interesting to monitor the state and health of the, the cluster that you're running? And then my second question is from my 10-year-old son. He wants to know why you removed Blitzcrank's Poro Roundup from the App Store. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is an excellent question. Uh, for those of you who got to stick behind, let me show you something real quick. I, I was wondering if I'd have time to demo some things. Uh, Oh, no, my VPN died. All right, um, I'm not going to waste time. Um, yes, we are doing something special to monitor, but it's not that fancy. Uh, we use CADvisor. So the question was, how do you monitor this? And then I'll get to the Riot questions in a second. Uh, how do you monitor all this? Uh, we deploy CADvisor as one of those service containers. It's a, it's a Google open source container to pull uh, basic metrics off the system uh, to every host. We pipe that uh, to... Uh, an, in -o, or not an, in -o, an influx DB time series database that's also just running as a container off to the side. Uh, that wasn't enough metrics. We wanted some other data. In particular, we wanted a specific explicit count on each host of dead containers, stopped containers, total image counts. Cadvisor didn't have that at the time we started this, so we created our own little container using Python that pulls that data and pumps that into a Graphite server, again, running in a in a Docker container, these are not huge amounts of data. And then this front end, if my VPN was working, is, is Grafana, uh, where we just visualize it all. And if it had been up, you would see this glorious like total number running of, of images or build jobs. It's where I get my builds per hour count. So yeah, it's not hard. My next blog, everybody keeps asking me about this. My next blog is literally going to be about how to stand that stuff up. It's a lot of Docker pulls and a little configuration. It's all open source. Uh, as far as the why did you pull Blitz Prank Pour a Roundup off the store? <laughs> Uh, if your son missed it, there was some messaging at the time about that being sort of an experiment for the fans for a month, uh, give or take. It was always meant to be a time-limited release. Uh, there are a lot of reasons. I'll be happy to talk to you more specific if you want the business reasons. But it boils down to uh, mobile games take a serious amount of development power to keep running over a long period of time. iOS changes versions all the time. Uh, we wanted to give something back to the fans. Uh, but we wanted to be clear that we weren't going to be here in four years making sure Blitzclaim Pro Roundup worked with iOS 5000. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, so if he got a copy of it, awesome. He's now got a collector's iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, so um, we're doing uh, something very similar to what you've set up. Um, and we're starting to run into some resource constraints in the actual engines we use to build Docker containers. So like application teams that are actually building the Docker containers, like your dry dock, I think. Yep. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how to horizontally scale that. Because you can't put that behind a swarm. Because if you tried to make that in a swarm, if I run Docker push, and Docker build, they might run on di different Docker engines, right? So I need to be able to tether myself specifically to a Docker engine for some amount of time so that I can do my build, tag, push, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I need to be able to horizontally scale that so I have a bunch of you know, VMs behind it or Docker engines behind it. All right, so, so the question, if I understand it correctly, is Docker Swarm is a bit cumbersome to deal with multiple client requests. A good exa work case example would be Docker build against a Swarm endpoint. Uh, we'll probably do the build somewhere and create an image. And then if you try to Docker push, you might end up on a different Docker host. Um, my understanding is that's actually not what happens. If, so long as you're talking to the Swarm endpoint, it sees the images and is capable of pushing that image back. That said, we don't do it that way uh, for those, those particular challenges. In this farm, the Docker builds and Docker pushes are all coming from inside the system. Uh, if necessary, if dry dock doesn't scale, uh, if, we, if we hit that point, we may have to create some additional places to build or additional solutions. I don't have a perfect answer right now. Uh, because dry dock is just a golden image of a thing, we could actually probably provision one. Uh, we've even considered potentially just for this one use case, provisioning the Docker container in a container at a fixed endpoint and doing it against that and then throwing it away when we're done instead. But that would take a little bit more hookup, and we haven't needed to scale that far yet. So sorry I don't have a perfect answer for your scale case. But if you want to like theory craft afterwards, come find me. Over here on the right. Easy question. Would you publish your presentation in your GitHub for us? Uh, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, I think Docker is actually going to make them all available, but I will happily make this as a PowerPoint slide and put it right into the, into the GitHub doc. All right. Oh, oh question over here. Uh, sure, let me go find that slide. Thank you.